Good evening and welcome to Crime Corner. I'm Omnidog, but for tonight I'm Darth Braggadocia. And we'll tell you why, um, sort of. Are we allowed to say why on air or do you want to keep it a secret? Um, well, we'll talk about it. That's the Minister of Comics. That's the <laughs> Minister of Comics there chiming in. Taylor Brown, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And Jess and I were just talking about how we're both freshly shorn, how Jess looks quite young and hip with his uh, hipster haircut. It was more for utility than anything else, but ended up working out to make you look more fashionable, I guess. Right on, man. I just told him to uh, cut it as short as possible and leave me something to comb, it, just to comb, uh, because I don't want to go back to the barbershop till like April. I'm just, I'm <laughs> quarantining myself. So I went to... Uh, Costco and I we I I bought like there was an apocalypse coming so we're all set there and uh we're quarantining ourselves because if anybody's going to get covid it's me and I'm just cuz I'm always sick and so I just don't want to go out at all. Yeah, you're kind of a magnet for health disorders. I, I am. That's that you don't want to be that kind of magnet but unfortunately that's your that's your lot I guess. Right. <laughs> Well, it's good that you, it's the, the pandemic hit you at a good time of life when you're retired and your wife was able to retire too. So yeah, it was, I don't want to say perfect timing, but it kind of was. Yeah. We got lucky as far as being able to uh, have the, uh, the luxury of just being able to stay inside. Uh, I understand what I just can't fathom how hard it must be to, I mean, the, the scenario of being a single parent in this environment that has to work boggles my mind at how hard that must of the life that must be. Oh yeah. I'm definitely blessed to be able to have Kate and I, I mean, we were just talking today. We're both thankful that we haven't, you know, both of us still have our jobs and everything. You don't have yeah. to worry about finances. That's not the case for a lot of people right now. Yeah. Ooh, we got a big compliment here. Post paused force awakens for this. Love the show. I happen to love Force Awakens, so uh, that is a huge compliment. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, it wouldn't have been much of a compliment if he said I paused the Rise of Skywalker. Then I would have been like, eh, I would have paused that for anything. <laughs> you wouldn't even be watching it. Probably. No, I haven't. I actually haven't watched it since I saw it in theaters because it was so disappointing to me. Right. It, it was by no means the worst movie I've ever seen or anything like that, but it was so disappointing. After The Force Awakens, I, I had some nitpicks, especially with the planet-sized uh, Death Star they had to deal with. It was, it was a lot of very much the New Hope kind of rehash, but it was still enjoyable. The Last Jedi, I know a lot of people hated it. I loved it. I, I thought it was a, a nice new direction. Rise of Skywalker was just a failure, disappointment at every level for me. I'll say it just for me. I know some people do like it. Now – there were two things that ruined my daughter's year last year, and they ruined your year too. I would say they ruined my year, but they were big disappointments. I would say that was, I would say Game of Thrones was worse because I invested so much time into it. How many hours How many I invested time? into it? Because with yeah. the sequel trilogy, I invested like five hours up until that point. Okay. Compared to how many hours of Game of Thrones there were. And I loved every season of Game of Thrones besides the last one. All of a sudden, it took a huge drop in quality. And I have some sympathy for the showrunners because George R. R. Martin is slow as crap and he hasn't even come close to finishing the last two books. So they didn't sign on to write the ending. I yeah. understand that. But it just was a horrible ending. It seemed like they were just ready to move on and do something else. And so yeah. it was kind of haphazardly put together. So that, right. that's how I felt at least. Well, I never. I only watched the first season and then I had my daughter show me all the death scenes on YouTube. Uh, so I knew who all the characters were enough to uh, know uh, why um, who they were and why it was important, the kind of deaths they had. So that was good. And she just caught me up with it and showed me like the last half hour uh, of the show and just said, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, that's enough. I don't, I'm not into it enough to watch seasons two through seven or whatever it was. So. I mean, the ending for me was so bad that I'll never rewatch any of the show again. Yeah, I wonder if my daughter feels that way because she was, uh, I, I mean, she's still in pain. <laughs> she's still in pop culture pain from the Game of Thrones ending and uh, Rise of Skywalker. I am fine 
because I thought Rise of Skywalker was okay, and I it didn't you know ruin anything for me like Jar Jar Binks did, but I did I don't I suffered nothing from Game of Thrones, so nothing invested, nothing lost. What do you think is probably your biggest like nerd or pop culture disappointment that you were looking forward to something like the the hype level was extremely high, and you saw it and it was like oh that was horrible, or I just didn't I hated it. Dark Knight Strikes Again. Uh, okay. Well, probably the prequels for you, too. The Star Wars prequels. Oh, oh yeah. Those were a huge disappointment. I, I went to number three just out of a sense of duty to say I saw them. And number I, three is the best one out of all those three. It's the least painful. I'll put it that way. Yeah. I feel like three would actually be a decent movie if Hayden Christensen and Natalie Portman weren't in it. Because <laughs> Natalie Portman's a great actress, but for some reason, when you put her in a Star Wars movie, she was horrible. She just couldn't act. I mean, she was put up against a piece of wood. So I can understand how it was hard for her to act off of Hayden Christensen. But I feel like the movie would actually be decent without those two actors. The dialogue is still painful, but the story is interesting. But unfortunately, Hayden Christensen is not a good actor, and he's the main character of that story. And so that really bogs down the whole movie. Yeah. Um, and I asked Riley this last night when he went over. Oh, I guess you were watching the show what the point of having Hayden Christensen come back to a show that's set 10 years in the future and Darth Vader generally only removes like the top half of his helmet. He needs the breathing apparatus and he's bald and disfigured so they could get anybody to do that. And he better not say a word. It better only, they better be getting James Earl Jones right now before he passes away to voice all of it. They also have some other, another actor who can play James Earl Jones to a T. They've used oh, him in other projects. You, I mean, he's a, he's a, I mean, he, he definitely is a definitive voice, but he has a voice that's easily imitatable. Mm, so they, okay. there, I think there is an actor they've used for other projects that does sound a lot like him. But even when you listen to Rogue One, he definitely sounds a lot different. He's obviously older. And so yeah. you can definitely tell he's it's his the voice is a lot different. So I'm not sure I mean, they probably will use James Earl Jones if he's able to, but they do have other actors they can bring up who sound a lot like him. Okay, um, and I, I just think Hayden Christensen's part. Of course, I'm guilty of uh, what I always preach against, and that's judging a show before it's even on the air. Wait and see what it's like, and then you can judge it. Uh, so. Uh, I just, I just don't like Hayden Christensen. <laughs> That's the problem. If I, if I had to guess, I would think it's going to be like Force dream interactions that they have together. Like maybe Obi-Wan and him connect via the Force. Because if they do flashbacks, they'll have to de-age both of them. Yeah. So, I mean, they can do that. We've seen that work well in the Marvel movies. So they, they could do it. Yeah. But they have to de-age them. It has to be a Force vision or something like that. I can't think of any other way to really utilize him in the show. And it might not even be like a huge part. It might just be one scene. We have no idea. Yeah. Like this new Spider-Man 3 movie has like everybody from previous movies. I mean, they, they could have big parts, but they could have small cameos. We have no idea. I'll be happy with anything because it sounds exciting to it me. It sounds like really overstuffed to me, so I'm hoping they're cameos. Yeah. I want it to have its own original, unique story. I don't want it to just be like a cameo fest and have it be centered on these other movies. I'm hoping it's going to kind of move ahead into its own story. But yeah. for the most part, I, there have been some Marvel movies I haven't enjoyed, but for the most part, I'm, I haven't been let down very much. So I give them the benefit of the doubt. I've liked both the Tom Holland ones. Uh, so I think my favorite, my favorite Spider-Man movie of all time is Into the Spider-Verse. That's one of my top five favorite superhero movies ever. I, it's so yeah. rewatched. My wife even loves it. We rewatch it a lot. It looks so good on my 4K TV. That's a great 4K movie to watch. And then second is Spider-Man 2. I love that movie. That's one of the best superhero movies ever. With Tobey Maguire. Doing the 4K flex right in front of us. <laughs> I do not have a nice 4K setup like Lou does. I have the bare minimum TV and Blu-ray, <laughs> and it's perfectly fine for me. I'm someone who doesn't need to have all the fancy bells and whistles like uh -huh. someone like Lou does. And that's more of his main hobby. Okay, I would say and then the, my third favorite is a tie between the original Spider-Man movie or Homecoming. Um, my wife uh, loves the Spider-Man movies. Those are the only Marvel movies she's ever seen. So I need to get her to watch Into the Spider-Verse because 
I agree with you. That is a fantastic movie. And she uh, is willing to because she's seen all the Spider-Man movies with me. That's one of the things she really likes. That's the only thing she likes. Um, has, so, has, she ever, has she ever seen Guardians of the Galaxy? My wife loves that movie. Uh, she probably would like that. I think she has seen Guardians of the Galaxy. We had my movie buddy and her husband over. And I think we all, uh, she and I had already seen Guardians. And then when it came out on DVD, I think we did see that, and she enjoyed it. Yeah, I think a lot of, I mean, for the vast majority, most people enjoy at least the first Guardians movie. I think the second one pulls too much on. I mean, I understood a lot of it, but you know, Ego, the Living Planet, and uh, the Eternals, uh, Kurt Russell, and everything. I think she would have gotten lost in the second one. But the first one, she, yeah, she definitely enjoyed. I think the first one's the better movie and it has a better story. I think the second one's funnier than the first one, though. Right. I think yeah. a lot of people, that's the reason why they don't like it as much, because I think it's too humorous. So they try to make it more of a oh. comedy. Oh, the second one? Yeah, because a lot of people don't like that movie, even though I enjoy it. Are they the same ones that don't like Thor Ragnarok, the best Marvel movie ever made? The crazy thing is there's some big haters of Thor Ragnarok, and they'll say it's the worst Marvel movie ever made. And it's like, I don't know about that. Have you seen The Incredible Hulk? <laughs> have you seen, I have actually you seen, haven't seen Thor either. The Dark World or Iron Man 2? Like, there are definitely some lesser Marvel movies than Thor Ragnarok, which is in my top ten. Yeah. It's not in my top five. It's in my top ten. Yeah. Um, here's a good question. You're going to get a vacation. So this is a really good question from Johnny there, Windows. What are you going to read on vacation? Do you have vacation reads set up? Like for Christmas vacation? Yeah. Or, um, or do you get a Christmas vacation? I have to uh, speak at church on the Sunday after Christmas. So <laughs> I have some time off that week. But uh -huh. I got to give the message like uh, online and things like that. So I have some – I have some uh, – some time off, but not as much as I usually do. But I just finished The World of Black Hammer today, and that was one of my books of the year. I love that. And I was telling Jess, the Dr. Andromeda story, I've never been more emotionally captivated by a story in, in comic form than that book. It involves a father and son moment, and I definitely more than teared up. I, I kind of like cried a little bit, which doesn't happen for me that often. Maybe the last time it happened was like last year. That was a fantastic book. I'm going to finish up the second Black Hammer library edition sometime this weekend. And I do want to catch up. I want to reread Paper Girls and finish East of West now that all of them are collected. Yeah. That's kind of my, I think that's my Christmas vacation read is East of West, Paper Girls, and finish Black Hammer. Uh, I'm definitely with you on finishing up Paper Girls and East of West. Um, I've already read uh, Black Hammer, both of them. Um, but uh, now that I uh, have a box to open that definitely has Paper Girls and East to West in it, Volumes 3, I'm going to uh, read that immediately because those boxes just arrived today. Oh, they did? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are we allowed to talk about why you're Darth Braggadocia? Because that kind of ties in. <laughs> It does. Let me make sure we're caught up on uh, questions. Well, actually, um, um, Doc Collector has a good question talking about the Black Hammer reading order. From what I've seen, uh, Dark Horse or it's Jeff Lemire released a official reading order for the library editions. It's Black Hammer number one, then it's World of Black Hammer number one, and then it's Black Hammer library edition volume two, and then the subsequent World of Black Hammer library editions that will come out next year. So that's the reading order that I've heard. Mm. And it's definitely important because the Sherlock Frankenstein ties in to an important thread from Black Hammer, the main book. Okay, so wait. Say read the that. reading order again. It's the first Black Hammer Library edition. Yeah. And it's the first World of Black Hammer Library right. edition. Then okay. the second Black Hammer Library edition. So okay. That second Black Hammer Library edition is the end of that main series. Mm -hmm. And there's two or three more library editions for World of Black Hammer coming out next year. And then you read those then. Okay. So that's, that's the reading order, reading order as of right now. Now that you're talking about it, maybe I should reread it. That I love those books. Uh, hmm. I will think. Of, I will give that a good think because you're right. That was one of the best books of the year. And I've been waiting to read East 
of West for a long time. I read the first volume, maybe when did the first one come out? Three years ago? Oh yeah. Three years ago. I read it. I loved it. And the second one came out and I'm like, what's the point of reading it now? I'll have to reread them all over again. Right. When the third one comes out. So I've been waiting for at least three years to read this final, this final collection. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, the chat is talking about Paper Girls, and I'm very excited to read Paper Girls. Uh, I believe in one of these boxes is Gideon Falls 5. Uh, so Which I'm Jeff will be selling next year to get the new hardcover. Yep. To get the library edition that's going to be dedicated to me. Jeff, everyone, Mary, give, everyone give Jeff a nice golf clap for his sacrifice. You're welcome. You were you, you really had a big uh, week. It was Middle West, Gideon Falls, Ether. What was the other? Oh, Scott Skyward is getting a hardcover. <laughs> yeah. Every every book that you love. There was a Marvel or DC one. I can't remember what it is. Yeah, I, I don't remember. There were so many. It was, it's hard to keep them and keep track of them. I know Invaders by Chip Zdarsky is getting a hard oversized hardcover, and I have those two paperbacks. So that's been out for a while, I think. That's coming out at the end of the month, I believe, the thirtieth. Right. I just and I just figured it out that I had the two paperbacks and that I wanted to read them. So I have to make a decision on if I'm going to sell them or not. I think they're going to start making a lot of Chip Zdarsky hardcovers because they're making that. They just announced a couple months ago the Daredevil Volume 1 hardcover. Yeah. Me too. I bought all those trades too. So we're in the same boat with that one. Yeah, okay. I, I bet they'll end up doing like a spectacular Spider-Man Omni or something like that. Or so, I don't know. Because he's, he's a really hot writer there. I think probably him and Donnie Cates are probably two of the hottest writers. Donnie Cates is number one over there, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah. But, I think Chip Zdarsky is definitely in the top three or five. Right I now. agree with that because the he sells because his writing's great. Oh yeah, and he has finished. I think uh, Sex Criminals Volume Three is coming out next year too because that's been a long time coming. That has been a very long time coming. I think he just became so popular as a writer. I'm sure Matt Fraction got distracted with whatever he whatever he was doing. So I think they just took a long hiatus. Kind of like how Saga has been on a super long hiatus. That's been like <laughs> since mid last year. I yeah. wonder, are they ever coming back? They didn't announce anything yet. And they still have half the run to go. I'm going to be, Sam's going to be like in college by the time that whole series is over. I, I, you're probably going to be going to my funeral before that series is over. I'll be reading it to you like in your nursing home or something. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a long drive, but I'll, I guess I'll do it. Well, by that time, technology will just have you hologrammed into my room. Oh, that's true. That's a that's a that's a really good idea. So yeah. if it gets to that point, I promise I'll do that for you. Okay. So the reason I'm Darth Braggadocia is because well, do you want to tell? We'll we'll tell our parts of the story. Well, it uh, started with you texting me, so yeah. you should probably start. I, I texted. Uh, I texted Taylor. We text throughout the day all the time, and I text. Texted him. Well, I'll show you because they're right here. I texted him a picture of this. Can you see that? Oh yeah. Like yeah. The tower. Yeah. Those are all from IST, and those came today. Um, so they were, you just found them on the porch, stacked up like that. Two two stacks. I wonder how many trips that was for the mailman. Just like probably two trips. A couple. It wasn't the mailman. It was UPS. Okay. And two of them are way heavy. And the other two are mid heavy, um, but um, I told I took a picture and told Taylor because um, it's gotten harder uh, to sneak things in because my wife is not only quarantined with me but she's retired, so she's here all the time. I can't sneak Jack in, so I have to be really. You did uh, have a good streak for a while though, where she was yeah. always upstairs doing something, but then you had a bad uh, streak as well recently. Yeah, I was out doing something, and I came home to like seven boxes in, in the hallway, and she just pointed to them and looked at me, and I was like, "Oh." So yeah, another reason not to leave the house right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, you saw those. You saw those packages, and then what happened? I uh, crazy Jane. That's a good question. I told her. Uh, yesterday, and I do, actually, this is something that we do every year, but it, it was more evil this year. 
I said, you can't get any packages from the uh, front door because it'll give away your Christmas present. Because a lot of times it doesn't just come from Amazon. It'll say like uh, 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 Ann Taylor or um, Land's End or whatever the store is. I order from stores all the time and it comes in the store box. So I said, you can't go to the front door at all from now until Christmas. I'll get the packages because I don't even remember what I asked for. That's, a, you know, obvious that I, I don't remember what I asked for. So I said, so she can't go. So she's in the family room. And I said, up, oh, don't move. Uh, I have to get some boxes. And she goes, okay. So it was those four. And I got them down to the basement. Did you stack them all up like with four or did you have to take multiple trips? I took two trips. I thought you were going to be like the mother who lifts the car off her baby. <laughs> has, like, all, even though you have your cast on, you get you, you summon the strength to pick up four boxes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, okay, I got to make two trips. So you stay there. And, and so, Let me see the text that you sent me. The way you phrased it was funny. You just texted me out of the blue and said, you know, a great thing about Christmas, telling Patty not to look at the packages because she might get a spoiler and I get this. And he sent me the whole picture of all the stacks. So I said, he said, I'm an evil genius. And I said, yeah, you're Darth Braggadocious. Of your last name, Brag. And you said, no, I'm Darth Braggadocia. Well, that was my nickname right? in college was Braggadocia. So I just adjusted it a little, but it was a good nickname. Jess says he's retired, but he's still a smuggler. So he still has a he still has an important job to carry out right now. Yeah, oh, crazy Jane needs some pro sneak tips. Uh, just to PM me or email me, I'll help you out. Yeah, sneaking stuff used to be a lot easier before the pandemic. That's for sure. Oof. Yeah, and retirement. Um, well, Jess, the one thing you do is that you don't put the well. This time you didn't do it, but a lot of times you'll put different boxes in different parts of the basement. So it doesn't, so it doesn't look as bad because <laughs> if you have them stacked up four boxes deep, that looks horrible. So you're breaking your own rules right now. Well, she's not supposed to come down here into this room either because this is where all my Christmas presents are. So yeah, that's so, where stack, stack the boxes here. I saw your post of her putting up the Darth Vader and I was like, oh man, she's really close to the, uh, the inner <laughs> sanctum. <laughs> yeah, she messes with me with that Darth Vader. That's funny. Um, so uh, I have four boxes to open, and I'm hoping that she doesn't uh, get wind of this. And Bobby, Bobby Keating says, Jess, you need to build a secret chute from the bushes in the front yard down to the basement. That's a good investment. Actually, there I could directly do that. The front, <laughs> the front yard <laughs> does uh go straight down into the unfinished part of the basement hey, don't you have like a back door or like a side door that goes down to your basement oh yeah right out here i have a walk out part of the basement you can do like delivery instructions <laughs> drop it off at the side door bring it down the steps to my secret hideout keep the change a filthy animal <laughs> joe chip thank you for asking since it's been in the cast it doesn't hurt uh, it hurt like heck, but now that it's been cast, uh, I can't move my hand very much, so um, it doesn't hurt anymore. So th thank you for asking. I appreciate that. And then we have, oh, Omar Reyes has a question about, um, I think he's talking about black magic. He said he got volume one off of our recommendation. Magic hardcover? I think he's talking about black magic. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, he's talking about, yeah, about black magic by Greg Rucka. If that's what you're talking about, there is no hardcover volume two coming out right now, but the latest arc is wrapping up. So they'll probably need to have another arc come out next year whenever they're going to do it, and then they'll solicit a hardcover. So it probably won't be for another year or two, I would assume. Probably two years. Yeah. Uh, I remember reading the first paperback when I was in the hospital getting my knees replaced. And that was before you even did Omnibros, right? Uh, 2016 is when I got my knees replaced. Oh, the hardcover wasn't out back. I think, did you have the trades first? You probably had I did, trade. yeah. Okay. I, had one, I had one trade. I had the first trade, and, and then the uh, OHC got announced, and I, w I decided to wait. Speaking of Black Magic, I know we're, we want to do an Ed Brubaker 
ranking. We should do a Greg Rucker ranking on Crime Corner too. That is a great idea. Because I mean, that's I think that'd be just as hard as an Ed Brubaker ranking for a lot of different books. Well, I think I know. I think I know what my number one would be. So I'm not going to say that because I'll ruin it. But for if you know, yeah, if you've watched our videos, you probably know. I think Jess and I both have the first have have the same number one Rucker book. I don't want to spoil it though for that video <laughs> if we do it. Um, the collector, I have that same app. Um, uh, it, it's uh, it tells you when. Uh, a package has shipped. It scans my email and my Amazon orders, and it tells me when something's shipped and when something's coming. And today, it was going off like a bad hell. It was just like ding, 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 ding. ding. <laughs> I had like eighteen packages come today. Imagine whenever you get those packages from those Dark Knight Metal figures that you ordered when those uh, start shipping. Yeah, I guess that'll, be, that'll be 2021. Jess's problem. Yeah, future Jess's issue. That's not your problem. Not my problem. Uh, yes, Black Magic, he said. Uh, let's see. And Jess, after your Omni Dog Omni Cat video in Lemire, I picked up Essex County. Good for you, dude. Great book. Great book. <laughs> hey, Chris O'Donnell, I got the, the Batman mythology trade. I've gotten that and uh, Stephen Amell um from arrow I, I don't really see it but i'm taking it as compliments i'm guessing chris o'donnell was a handsome man i don't know if he's as handsome as he used to be now but <laughs> that's a great book though uh yeah. it is i thought that's my favorite batman book is what it, i've come to the conclusion of yeah that's amazing um and so there's all these uh, people talking about the way. Okay, wait, what's this one? I had to ask my bank to start an account where she can't see my balance and what my transactions are. I got tired of having to buy those uh, Visa cards at Walmart to hide my purchases. I've heard about a lot of people doing that to avoid um, getting uh, whatever they're trying to smuggle, uh, buying Visa cards at Walmart to use them. Yeah, that's sure. an old alcoholic trick that you go oh, to the Walmart and then go to the ABC store and use them, and it doesn't show up as on your charge as uh, the liquor store. That's funny. Well, I remember you had that streak. It was maybe six months where your wife, five or six months where she didn't notice any boxes coming in. And I was saying, Jess, you have to let her see at least one box every once in a while or it's going to be really suspicious. Because then it's like, wait a minute. It's been no. six months. I haven't seen anything. Right. Um, and then she, I came, what was I doing? I think I, I think I had to go to the dermatologist and I had a doctor's appointment. Oh yeah. I had a couple of doctor's appointments back to back on like this past m Monday or last week. And so the house was unprotected by Darth Braggadocia. And you may be thinking, what does this have to do with crime? Well, this is the closest Jess will get to being a criminal in his life, being a smuggler. So this is the closest he's going to get. And uh, Professor Flex says, IST is a lot of people's side piece. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than the alternative, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't need a mistress. I'd rather have uh, books that I smuggle. And use oh. that Bitcoin money. <laughs> For books. Yeah, here's an important thing. Zach says, hit that like button. That's right. We, uh, I need likes because it helps in the uh, YouTube algorithm uh, when people go searching for, um, like if they go searching for TKO books and they can make it through the first half hour of tangent that we've talked. <laughs> um, the, if there's a lot of likes, it pops up to the top. So please like this uh, video. Even if you dislike it, just hit the like. Don't dislike it. Like it. For the most part, people like our tangents. There are like one or two, one or two people who are like, I can't watch the whole thing. Tell me when the review oh, yeah, starts. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> we got a couple of comments that says, main video starts 40 minutes in. <laughs> people, but the funny thing is, Whenever we do the tangents, the views are up. And I, I check the views during the reviews, and they go down a little bit, and they pop yeah. back up. So you have, you have to give the people what they want. Yeah. People like our tangents better than um, our reviews. Yeah. Here's Felipe Arenas. He just joined in. Hey, dude. How's it going? Thank you for joining. Um, 
Chase Chu says, getting a box in the house undetected is the perfect crime. I agree. Uh, so, uh, is Inman 40 in the chat? Oh. I haven't seen him yet. I don't think so. Carly likes the tangents of the main video, LOL, and Zach really enjoys the tangents personally. Which we try and keep them comic book related, so that we're, we're at least talking about comic books. I don't know. Two months ago, we talked about like nostalgia and like rotary phones and things like that. And we did. I don't yeah, we talked. Yeah, we talked about that for a long time. So, yeah, sometimes it can get off tan. It can get off into a tangent that has nothing to do with comics, but for the most part, we try to keep it. Comic <laughs> Taylor, related. I come from the tangents. I didn't know this was a review channel. <laughs> Well, we've we've noticed like on batter days, you might have noticed we've been doing a lot of topics lately because those are the ones that people show up for and people really seem excited about. So uh, we've been doing a lot of topic videos recently that have done really well. There's Kenny Crayley. How you doing, buddy? It's what? okay, Kenny. You have you have, you have your own life. No need to apologize. Yeah. Uh, if it wasn't for Kenny, uh, I would not know. I would not have known in time to order those McFarland figures from GameStop because he posts toy news. Uh, and I really appreciate that, Kenny. I wouldn't know. I don't. I don't uh, subscribe to anything on Twitter. I don't really look at my. I don't subscribe to anything on Instagram. I. I really don't. Uh, I know a lot of people, and I probably should because that's how everybody gets these announcements. But if it wasn't for Kenny's posting, I wouldn't know anything about toys and action figures. So I always appreciate when Kenny posts about uh, action figures and stuff. Is he, he's more of a DC guy. So it's probably more of the DC action figures, right? Um, no, it's usually what I look at that he posts is the stuff is the announcements from toy arc. Um, and that covers everything. So you just pick out what you want from the toy arc announcement. Um, so, and Zach has a question for me that I can answer pretty quickly at 7.37. He asked, do I have any plans oh. to read Berserk or any other manga? Uh, unfortunately, I do not. Manga is just not for me. And even most anime, like the my favorite anime isn't even the anime, and that's Castlevania. So I know anime experts would tell me that's not anime. But probably the only anime I actually like that is anime is Cowboy Bebop. So those like, the only, yeah, you have that shirt on right now. Those are the only two shows like that I actually kind of mess with. And manga in general, like I tried Dragon Ball Z and some other stuff. It's just not for me. And it's great if you like it. It's just not for uh, Darth Braggadocia and I, personally. Yeah. Darth Braggadocia. I listen to the show for the tangents and secretly hope you guys don't waste too much time on the reviews. <laughs> uh, the reviews usually last 30 minutes and the tangents last for an hour, an hour and a half. So, <laughs> comparatively. I don't even know what the topic is today. LOL, yet I'm here. <laughs> Everyone in the live chat comes for the rambling and sticks around for the topic. Well, we'll have to see. And we'll have to see uh, Omar's mean. asking us if we think Future State will bomb. Uh, it's hard to, I mean, it's only going to be a two month initiative. So if it does bomb, I mean, I, I'm sure it would be hard for them, but it's not going to be a, like a year long event. So that would make it a lot easier, I think. Where is uh, – I, I saw that too. 738. Where... <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, I know Jess is excited, more excited about it than I am. Um, I just – Just I, because I, of Brazilian I, Wonder Woman. Yeah, I think Omar is right that it's kind of like a hodgepodge version of 5G that was kind of thrown out whenever Dan DiDio was let go, and they're kind of trying to salvage some of the work they did for that. Mm. Uh, but it just seems ra like a two-month – line wide event. I guess not even really an event, it's more like a line wide rollout of these books. But for two issues for this really high concept just doesn't seem like it's going to be that in depth, it's not going to be that immersive. So, I don't want to prejudge it, but I'm just not that excited for it. Maybe I'll be unexpectedly surprised by it. I also don't know how they're going to collect it in collected edition. How can they collect two issues? Or it's maybe the characters only going to get two issues. I think isn't it? It's only two months long, right? Or maybe I have no idea. But the most it'd be like four issues if they're double shipping. But yeah, it's not going to be that much. If somebody knows how it's going to work, let us know. But I, I don't, the only thing I know is that it's supposed to be like a two month long yeah. initiative. Uh, I am going to wait 
to see, but you ha bring up a good point. How are they going to collect it? Yeah, I just don't see how they can collect that small of issues for these series. I don't know. It kind of just reminds me of the whole convergence thing. <laughs> Ooh. And that was really bad. Yeah, the only thing good that came out of convergence... Did the Superman did Superman and Lois or Clark what was that book called by Tomasi? Did that come out of that? The Final Days of Superman? Uh or was that after Convergence? You know, I ignored Convergence pretty completely. So I mean, I collected a couple of Adam Hughes covers from it, but I don't remember anything really about it. Maybe before uh, Watchmen came out and during Convergence. I seem to remember that being a Convergence book. I think before Watchmen was around when the like around when the movie came out, like after the movie came out. No. Oh. But yeah. Ben Uncle has some ideas about the trades. Maybe they've already announced them. He says the collection seem to be based on different families. There'll be like three different series per trade. So there, there, I guess there'll be like a Superman family, a Bat family, things like that. Okay. Well, that's so, something. Yeah, so I'm I'm not trying to totally crap on it and say it's going to be horrible. It could be great. I just don't have a lot of high hopes for it. Uh, okay, convergence is where the OG Lois and Clark reappeared. So that's like the one good thing that came out of convergence. Right. We that's both enjoyed that series. The only thing I really remember reading. I I opted out of convergence as soon as it happened. Well, yeah, can, I was still doing floppies, so I remember telling my LCS no pulls from this uh, convergence thing. I don't yeah, that's probably to... one of the most hated DC events, wouldn't you say? I I didn't even know yeah, I yeah. I didn't even I did not want to participate in it. That's probably when my event weariness set in when I said I I can't do it. I'm not into it. I'm not buying all these different books about with some event. I don't even know what convergence was. Yeah, what? I don't really know. I, I never read it because I heard so many bad things about it. <laughs> no, I, I don't even know. I kind of, yeah, because the rebirth was the exciting thing for a lot of people. When, right. When you, beginning of New 52, yeah. beginning of New 52, a lot of people were upset, a lot of the OG readers, but it brought in a lot of newer readers. And then rebirth, I think for the most part in the beginning, was really exciting for a lot of people. Yeah. And it kind of tapered off for some. But I think Convergence was the very end of New 52, and people were just kind of done at that point. With New Fifty Two, mm -hmm. and people were really excited about Rebirth when it when it came around. Even yeah. though the main the main draw of Rebirth, we're trying to figure out oh what how did the New Fifty Two come about? How is it changing? It took yeah. me so long. It took four years with Doomsday Clock and the button things like that. And it didn't really end in the most satisfying way. I think Doomsday Clock was a better Superman story than a DC Universe story. Right. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oxmeat Pete was the first one checking in today. We're all worried about Jesse Saywood. Is he okay? He's uh, yeah, that. I don't know. The first person in the chat. I don't see Jesse. Uh, if you could spend 24 hours with a comic character, who would it be? I, you probably think I'm going to say Harley Quinn. Yeah, I would think. But I currently have a major crush on... Elizabeth Olsen's Scarlet Witch. I can't wait for WandaVision. And I'm uh, thinking about watching Avengers, uh, the last two movies, again, just so I can see her. Actually, she appears, she starts in the second Avengers movie, right? Does she and Quicksilver show up in the second? Yeah, they're kind of used as pawns against the Avengers in... Uh, Age of Ultron and ended up coming over to the Avengers towards the end. Right. Spoiler, spoiler for a six-year-old movie that we've all probably seen. <laughs> if you haven't seen Age of Ultron by now, it's your fault. Yeah, I agree with that. So you're saying it's not just Scarlet Witch, though. You're saying Elizabeth Olsen's Scarlet Witch. Yeah, I'm being specific. Okay, so it's not really a comic character. It's more of a MCU character. I don't know. I feel like I love Batman, but it'd, be, it'd probably be pretty depressing hanging out with him for a whole day. I don't know if I feel like hanging out with Spider Man would be pretty cool. That'd be pretty fun. Hanging out with Peter Parker. I think it'd be fun to hang out with Deadpool. I feel like that would get old after a while. Yeah. 
<laughs> I feel like he would just try to like uh, make fun of you to your own expense, and he would just pull pranks on you. It wouldn't be fun. Peter mm-hmm. would at least be a lot of fun. He would take you around New York to really cool spots. Yeah, I think that'd be really fun. Yeah, that's true. Um, and Zach, thanks for watching. Zach says he has to get to bed. It's around two a.m. There. Well, where are you? Are you in England, Zach? Thank you for. Um, I hope. Uh, um, hope you like the books. You, we are about to start discussing that. I promise you. Uh, we're <laughs> at forty minute mark. And now our viewers will drop to five. Yeah. <laughs> until, until the tangent comes back. Uh, Oxmeat likes our choices. All right. Awesome. Wait. Now, who did you? I picked Spider Man. Spider Man. Okay. I know. I think we both didn't pick our obvious choices because, again, I think Batman would be be kind of a uh, be kind of depressing to hang out with him. And you know, there wouldn't be much conversation with Batman either. It'd be me saying something, him going, hmm. Mm. Yeah, so there wouldn't be much converse. Nightwing would be cool, though. He'd yeah. be a lot of fun. Batgirl so would be cool. I would say DC would be Nightwing, because he. I think both, I think D, uh, Nightwing and Spider-Man are both fun-loving guys who would really yeah. give you a, a fun time on the town hanging out. Yeah. Uh, Nick Fury, not so much. <laughs> yeah, Gar- Garth Ennis' Fury, Fury Max character. Oof. Going to Laos and all those other places throughout the world that are um, war-torn countries. Emma Frost, I, as much as I love her, I think I'd be afraid of her in she real life. She like reads your mind too. Yeah, yeah. That's in the so, last, the last, the last person that Jess needs to hang out with is someone who can read his mind, if he, especially <laughs> if he's if he's dating them or married to them, because then all of your all of your smuggling ways will be will be shown for what they are, Jess. <laughs> that's a really uh, good question i'm still standing by spider-man and nightwing yeah uh i don't think i'd be hanging out with carnage mm. if you want to if you're gonna spend 24 hours straight with somebody they better be fun yeah wolverine no way <laughs> uh, magic i don't i think she has too many issues um I'm just looking around at my action figures. Supergirl would be fun, I think. Catwoman, I wouldn't trust. Damien, I would like to slap. Uh, um, 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 Tim. Uh, Tim Drake? Yeah, I like him. He'd be fun to hang out with. Oh, Power Girl, that's a good idea. She seems fun. Power Girl and Harley Quinn would be fun to hang out with for a day. Cause how, they're about, cool. how about Midnighter and Apollo? <laughs> it depends you'd be, on where you'd be, they, you'd be the third you'd be the third wheel though because they're, yeah. they're both together so maybe you wouldn't want to do that yeah I mean, bad. wonder woman would be cool to hang out with but i feel like i feel like she'd be like so like i don't know i feel like you'd feel like so much lesser compared to her though hanging out with her all day she, she's, well, she's just so perfect and she's so like noble like spider-man's like he's flawed he's not perfect right and I just feel like hanging out with Wonder Woman, you need to act like you're on your best behavior the entire time. Whereas Pi- with Peter, you can kind of let your hair down and be, kind of be yourself. Yeah. Plus, if she's like the Darwin Cook Wonder Woman, she's 6'4 and totally ripped, practically built like She-Hulk. Uh, so she'd tower over me, and it would be uh, – yeah. As much as I admire Wonder Woman, I, I, you're right. I'd feel inti- I would feel intimidated. I would too. Uh, Same with Superman too. Yeah, Darkhawk. I'm not spending two twenty four seconds with you. They couldn't pay you to hang out with Darkhawk. No way. Darkhawk would just come to your house and mess up your Wi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question, actually. That took us a long time to answer. That's a great question. Yeah, that is a fun question. Hot girl, she'd be fun. Here's a, here's another good question, Jeff. That spins out of that, and then we'll get to the reviews because we're like okay. 45 minutes in. Would you rather hang out with the DC characters, like the Justice League, for a day, or hang out with the Marvel characters for a day? Um, who who are my choices? You can hang out with any any of DC characters, or any of the Marvel characters. You can like you can hang out with any of them. For a day, we need to pick well, one. Omar Reyes says uh, Zatanna, and that is an, a very appealing choice to hang out with. Um, I hmm, that's a good question. Uh, the Marvel characters all are more flawed and would be more. Uh, 
I think they'd be easier to hang around. And more relatable. Yeah. But you get to see places that don't exist in real life if you hang out with the DC characters. You get to go to like Gotham, Metropolis, Metropolis. So I think I would pick DC just for that reason. Because you, you can see made-up cities that don't even exist in real life because all of Marvel takes place in our actual world. That's right. So I'd probably pick DC for that reason. And going to the Batcave and the Fortress of Solitude, you can't really beat that. There are no good um, alternatives for that in the Marvel Universe, except for maybe the uh, Xavier Mansion. Yeah. And also, if you hang out with Silver and Golden Age Arrow, Green Arrow, you get the Arrow Car and the Arrow Cave. <laughs> Jess would definitely want to hang out with the Joker Doc Collector, his favorite character. Ugh. And uh, Crazy Jane said that she would drop ass with Rainbow Batman. Oh, yeah, Rainbow Batman. I, should, I need to display that. It looks so good in its... Uh, card uh, cardboard set though. I just I left them in the box. That's one of the few action figure things that I have left in the box because it's presented so well. Um, the Rainbow Batman thing. Uh, drop acid. Well, you ready to start with the reviews? Uh, okay. <laughs> we'll we'll uh, pick up later some tangents. Everybody, don't worry. Yeah, if you want to hear tangents, we'll try and keep these book reviews to really short if you want us to go back on a big tangent. Do you want to jump into blue and green first and just not in the TKO lineup, and then we'll jump into TKO? Sure. All right. So I have it on Hoopla, so I can read the back while you show off some art, Jess. Okay, this is Blue and Green by Ram V, the uh, famous writer who wrote... What did he write that I He's love? Savage so much? Shores. My book. Savage Shores. I made. He's my a book definitely movie. big up and coming writer. This art, first of all, in this book is amazing. I'd never heard of this artist before either. Me either, and it's remarkable. All right, so here's the back while Jeff shows off some of the great art. Struggling musician Eric Dieter returns home for his mother's funeral and, under strange circumstances, finds a photograph of a late '60s jazz musician. The search for this musician's identity will soon become an obsession. That will take Eric down the spiraling depth of his ambitions, a journey that will erode his faith in reality, forcing him to confront the horrors of his own great expectations. So, Jess, what are your thoughts on this book overall? Well, overall, first of all, I thought the art was remarkable. It is it isn't so much illustrated as it's practically choreographed, where it's this art multimedia project where he has different panels, different colors, different textures, different mediums. I, you know, it reminds me a lot of David Mack's artwork. Yeah. It's like David Mack mixed in with Dave McKean sort of. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good explanation of him. I, I, I am really excited to re to see some more of this guy's art because it really set the tone for the book for me. Uh, it was very uh, moody and uh, re reflected really well what the character was going through. Um, and so I, I enjoyed it just, just for the art alone. It, it was very uh, emotive and evocative. And I, you felt what Eric uh, Dieter was going through. You, you felt it through the art. I mean, the, the words, the text and the word bubbles had some beautifully written uh, thoughts and sentences. And obviously the writer is gonna tell the artist to what to make this look like, but the artist then gives it his own interpretation. And this kind of stuff is just amazing. Um, yeah, Ram V's prose is beautiful. He's a, he's very good. At, I think he should he, he should try to write a novel. I think he his prose is excellent. Like some of the narration, some of the dialogue. I mean, a lot of times in comics, the narration, the thought bubbles, they can be more they can be more workmanlike. Like oh, we have to. It's like that's not really their bread and butter. But there are some writers who are excellent with language, and yeah. Ram V is definitely excellent with language. He's definitely a wordsmith. So I think he's a great writer in that way. Yeah, and I found that the overall story what it did to the character uh what 
uh, is um, finding the picture, what it does to the character, what he goes through. He's he's coming uh, home. I, we don't. I don't want to spoil it, but we have to set it up a little bit. He's he's coming home because his mother died, and he and his sister are sort of at odds um, about things. They're upset he hasn't come home in a while. Yeah, he's been too wrapped up in his music. He's a music teacher, and he's sort of. Um, he never achieved the great uh, fame and accomplishment that they thought he would as a young musician. Yeah, it's the old adage of those who can't do teach. Kind of like he wasn't able to make it as a famous music musician. Now he's teaching at a college. Right. Um, and so he comes home for his mother's funeral, and the house is a big, uh, very big historic home. And he, he finds this picture, becomes obsessed with it. Who is this guy? And it leads to the to the the main story where he's going different places trying to track down this guy and how he becomes possessed uh, musically and personally by this guy in the picture and maybe an outside presence. I don't want to um, give too much away, but there's there's a a bit of a uh, ghostly element to this book. It's more of a horror book than anything else, I would say, like a psychological horror yeah. story. And it's marketed as a horror and a crime story. There's a slight crime story in there that kind of plays into the main story, but not yeah, too much. Pretty tiny. Um, but we do, uh, when do we talk about the real issue? What did you think? <laughs> of? Well, I'll put it, I think the issue we're going to talk about in a few minutes is kind of emblematic of the whole book for me. I think there's a lot of excellent pieces in it. It doesn't come together as a cohesive whole for me in the end. I think this book could have used a really strong editor. And I looked at the main uh, the main front page where it tells you who did what, and there's no editor. And I could, I could really tell that. I think mm -hmm. Ram V needed someone to have an extra set of eyes to say, you missed that. That's a big mistake. That's a logical misstep. <laughs> These peaks need to come together a little bit better. There are a lot of cool elements in this story. I don't think they really came together in the most cohesive way, in my opinion. I think it's good, but I think it could have been a lot stronger if they took multiple passes at that script a little bit more. Okay. That's and one really, of the and one of the it, main it might seem like a really really small nitpick, but I think it's really emblematic of my problem with the whole book. In the beginning, he has to fly home to for his mother's funeral, okay? But then later on, he walks back to where he works. He walks back to his ha his apartment in New York, and his par his parent his family lives in New York. So where is he flying in from? Yeah, and that might seem like a small nitpick, but it's like, how did they miss that? It doesn't really, unless there's a big thing I'm not seeing. We we both agreed that he's flying no nowhere. That he really this this airplane doesn't belong in this book at all. Because he's traveling from like Brooklyn to the Bronx or something. Yeah, he walks right? back. Yeah, he walks back to his apartment from his mom's house, essentially, later yeah. on in the book. And again, you might be like, Taylor, you're nitpicking, but this is evidence, you know, exhibit A in why this book needed a stronger editor or an editor at all, because someone else would catch that. Yeah. You know, we've all written things that we've looked over a ton of times, and then you realize someone points out a mistake later because you're kind of blind to certain mistakes that you're going to make. That's why I think every writer, even if you're an independent writer at Image or anywhere else, have an editor because they'll catch things that you're not going to catch. So that's the reason I think this book isn't great for me. It was just good. There, the prose is beautiful. The art is fantastic. I love the jazz element, but it wasn't a cohesive story, and it definitely was sloppily edited. So that's how I feel about it. Right. I, I liked it a lot more than, than you did. Um, I liked it a, a lot more than you did. Uh, but that, that airplane element, Chris M says, maybe that's the key to the story, but it's, it doesn't really play into it, uh, that I can see because it never is addressed again. I don't see how it actually fits in the story. But I definitely liked it a lot more than you did. I, I you know, you're we differ on on some books, and this is one of the ones we differ on that I liked it a lot more than you did. But I get 
what you're saying about an editor would have picked up on the airplane thing at least. And the whole crime element, uh, the kind of set back in the seventies or the sixties, that felt really shoehorned in. It wasn't really explained that well. I think it was supposed to be a big part of the story that didn't really make sense that much to me. So I just feel like there were some parts that could have been fleshed out a little bit more. I'll well, put it that way. I wonder because since I lived through it that I understood it better and it seemed it was fine. I, I the crime story is supposed to provide like the backstory for the main antagonist. Well, that's true. But I feel like it didn't really flesh out the antagonist that much and kind of show you what he was up to, especially back then, and how it tied into that, – that's how I feel. I don't want to get into but, the details of it. It's really not a crime story, though. It's the psychological horror thing. Right. But it just seemed like that part was kind of shoehorned in a little bit. Like, yeah. It didn't need to be there. Like It would have been stronger if they took that part out is what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm saying it would have been stronger or, if the crime yeah. element was kind of taken out of it. It didn't yeah. really feel like it belonged in the story. So there's a lot of really awesome pieces, a lot of awesome ingredients that didn't end in the tastiest of final products for me, even though I think there are a lot of great <laughs> aspects to it. Okay, it's time to go back on a tangent because we've lost viewers. <laughs> well, actually, uh, Omar has a question for us. Yeah. It kind of ties into the reviews. This is um, a good question. So, Jess, what has been your favorite TKO book to come out recently? Or ever? Recent well, it's like start, it started last year. So, um, I personally feel like Sentient by Jeff Lemire has been my favorite TKO book. Sarah was uh, incredible by Garth Ennis, and that would be my number two. But I also, I the first wave was a wave of four very, very strong books. They went from uh, an average to me of very good to fantastic. Every book was at least very good. Like the fantastical, awesome Dr. Fang or whatever it was called. Yeah. Was, I, I can't remember now and I, and I can't get up to get it. Uh, the Dr. Fang story was fantastically fun, like an Indiana Jones story. Um, and the other two books, uh, uh, Good Night Paradise. Yeah, and Seven Deadly Sins. Um, and Seven Deadly Sins, yeah. Seven Deadly Sins, to me, was the weakest of the books, and it was still very good. Mm -hmm. um, then Wave 2 came out, and all the only one I liked was Sentient. I didn't care for the banks or Pound for Pound. or I thought you kind of liked Pound for Pound. I, I thought you were more in the positive side than the negative. I've been thinking about it, and I think it's going on the giveaway pile. Oh, the fearsome Doctor Fang. That's what it was. Fearsome Doctor Fang. Okay, yeah, that I really like that book. Um, I pound for pound has an element at the end that kind of took me out of the story. It was kind of a marketed as a crime story that kind of had like almost like a supernatural villain towards the end, right? Like it was like a kind of out of left field. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't read it. That's what I've heard, though, from you guys. Yeah, uh, the Banks was one of the worst story, worst comic books I've ever read. Um, pound for pound, I'm, I think I'm going to give away. Sentient was fantastic. What was the fourth one? The uh, the one about the girls. Um, oh, uh, Eve of Extinction. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was okay, but I it's not a book I'd recommend. Yeah, so I, besides Wave 3, I only own three of the stories, and I agree with you that Sentient is my favorite by far. I think there's a reason why it was but nom nominated for an Eisner for Best Series. Yeah. And then Sarah's a close second. Like, it's pretty close for me. And then Good Night Paradise, I love that book. Yeah, I love that book, too. That was a, I mean, it's, it's about a homeless guy who goes around um, Venice Beach, I think, as a detective trying to solve a murder. And that was just all the right ingredients for me. I yeah. think Joshua Dysart's an excellent writer who really invests himself in his protagonist and does so much research. You can tell it took him a long time to write this story and really invest in that area and di diligently talk to people, see what it's like to be homeless. That's a fantastic story. Yeah. In, in uh, full disclosure, Omar, I've gotten all three waves courtesy of TKO uh, who have sent um, – me review copies. I got uh, review copies from the Omni Bros for the first wave. 
Then the second wave, I think I got them with the fangirls um, to review. And then you and I got comped these copies for review. Yeah, I want to say that TKO is a really awesome company. And they're oh, really yeah. generous. Like, they're really kind. And they're really they um, are. they're really responsive. So, I mean, whenever we get these, I, I, I go at it with an honest review. Yeah. So I'm not gonna just gonna be like, oh, it's the best. You know, I'm not gonna just say they're awesome because they sent them to me. But I do appreciate TKO and I love their business model. Yeah. I think this idea of bingeable comics in our society is a great idea, and they have put out some fantastic books. Yeah. Um, I will say that two out of the three books, I really. Okay, uh, one of the books I really, really love. One of the books I loved. One of the books I really, really liked. And then one of the books from this we third wave. I would say I'm kind of indifferent to it. So let's start with the one that you love. Let's start there. Start positive. The one that I love is Lonesome Days, Savage Nights. I love this. Uh, you have to, of course, do suspension of disbelief because it's about a private investigator that gets attacked by a werewolf and becomes a werewolf himself. He has a little, he has control over it, and he um, let, let me let me highlight you. Uh, he he has control over his werewolf abilities. Uh, he's um, kind of a down on his luck. He only got like two weeks on the police force before he was bounced out. So he's a private investigator now, a little bit down on his luck, but he can turn into a werewolf. It was a little predictable in that I knew as soon, well, no, I don't want to ruin it for people. Something happens that's pretty predictable um, to someone, uh, and that sparks the book, sparks him into action. Um, the The bad guy in this, um is like a crime overlord that i actually felt like he could have been more stereotypical and i felt he was written better than that he was an interesting um i think he was an interesting crime lord from my perspective um and i i thought we got enough of the characters uh, the main characters, we got enough exposure to them to start to care about them, especially um, the uh, Stu Manning, who was the werewolf PI. So I, I enjoyed the fact that, like the were when he werewolf's out, he he can smell um, his height, his sense of smell is heightened, and that's the way he can track some of these criminal gangs back to their hideout. I thought that was interesting. Um, I thought that the crime lord connection to him uh, and his building was set up interestingly. And it came to a uh, good, con uh, nicely written conclusion that I hope will lead to more um, books of Stu. Well, it's, it's marketed as volume one. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. I, I believe it's meant to be an ongoing series. Well, and, I think... And even the, the way it ends, I don't want to ruin it, but it sets it up for more. Yeah. The way it, it ends sex does set it up for more. And I think that um, I, I loved the art. I thought it was good. I uh, loved him versus the gangs aspect of it. Um uh, and I also loved how he fought the werewolf inside of him and referred to him as um, his, like his partner in crime or something, uh, he or his second self. It was, um, um, and uh, he he has like dual personalities where it's like him and the werewolf inside him. And he has like a best friend on the police force who's kind of trying to help him, but also being like, dude, you're just like destroying a bunch of gangsters. Like he like, when he, when he uh, werewolves out, 
he doesn't just like scratch people a little bit. He like tears them apart. Like you see like intestines flying all over the place. My favorite part of this book was the action scenes. I yeah. thought those were awesome. Yeah. In my opinion, those were really cool. It wasn't just like he just kind of scratches them a little bit or throws them against the wall. Like he actually tears them apart. Yeah. A cut, like multiple heads fly in this book. I'll put it that way. Oh yeah. And guts are spilled all over the place. So that part was the best part for me that I really enjoyed. I feel like I liked this book. I didn't love it uh -huh. because I, I, I'm a big PI fan and I love mysteries. I thought there wasn't much PIing. There wasn't much detecting. It was more of like a, <laughs> it was more like a revenge story. Yeah. So I kind of went into it expecting like a really solid central mystery, which I really didn't get. But the way it's set up at the end, Maybe there'll be more cases coming up in the future that will be more PI centric. So I think I went in with that expectation of like, oh, this would be a really cool mystery. And there was no mystery to it, if that makes sense. So yeah. going go into this book knowing it's more of an action revenge horror tale with some with some crime elements to it. So I think I went in with a different set of expectations than I probably should have. And like you said, I wasn't really surprised by anything that happened. Yeah, it was, it was very generic in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um. So I feel like I enjoyed it enough to I want to read another one and then decide if I want to go on from there. Yeah. I want it to be more of like a mystery. I want it to be more of a PI book. I still want those action scenes in there because that was awesome. Yeah. But I want there to be more of a cool central case he's trying to solve. If that makes sense. I I will hang on to this and read it again, and I hope that more of them come out. I definitely hope more of them come out. I'm intrigued enough to want to read more. Yeah, that's a good sign. Even though I feel like I was, I wasn't as good. It wasn't as great as I was hoping. It was definitely solid. It was good. I guess I had maybe an unfair set of expectations going into the book. Mm, I I didn't have any expectations after wave two. So, well, you know how much I love PIs. Like that's oh, like yeah. one of my that's like my favorite genre within that genre of crime. So I went into that with like, okay, I I, I want this out of it. I didn't really get that. And that's not really on the writer or the artist. Yeah. But I just wanted something a little bit more unique. Um, Chris M., I don't want to talk about Hawaiian Dick because <laughs> that that actually was one of my favorite comics, Hawaiian Dick. It was a great crime story. But on uh, Kickstarter, um, the creator ripped me off. Total. Ooh. The creator of Hawaiian Dick utterly and totally ripped me off. Uh, and so I do not want to give him any more, uh, I don't want to give him any airtime. Fuck him. I don't dig him at all. He, he makes me, I'm still angry at that. As you can tell, I just dropped the F word. Uh, that it, it is called Lonesome Days, Savage Nights. So, this was Jess's favorite. I think this is my second favorite. Okay. And so I think it's solid. I think it's worth the read. And I'm intrigued to see what happens in the future. I'm just hoping it's a little bit more original, a little bit more unique, a little bit more PI-ish. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. Well, then I bet Red Fork was your favorite. Red Fork was my favorite. Okay. Why don't you talk about it while I show the art? Okay, I'll read the back for you. Welcome to Red Fork. Ex-con Noah McGlade returns to his coal mining hometown to find it blighted by opioid abuse and economic decline. But there's something even darker draining the very life from this town. As Noah digs deeper, he unearths a dormant horror that threatens to consume what little he has left to live for. And so essentially this book opens up with these two brothers, Noah, and I forget what his other brother's name was, who commit a, uh, a crime. They break in to this doctor. I think it's actually a dentist's office to steal some medication because he's addicted to them. Opioids. And, yeah, it was opioids. He's addicted to them. And his brother's kind of the, the watch guy, making sure that nobody's going to catch them. And the dentist walks in and the brother kills the dentist. But Noah takes on ownership of the crime and says he killed the dentist. So Noah is put away in prison. He's eventually released. And he comes out of prison to this new um, era that's going on in his town where the coal mines – kind of been taken over, well, it's not just been taken over by this company, it's being improperly run by this company who doesn't really care about its employees. And a lot of people are dying of black lung, they're unemployed. And his brother, who he took the fall for his murder, he's been kind of taking care of their entire family. And everyone hates Noah because they think he's the one who murdered that dentist, while it's actually his brother. And then this supernatural force enters into the equation that emerges out of the mine. And this 
creature slash man has the ability to heal people. But the question is, does this healing come with a price? And that's where the horror element comes in. So I don't want to get into any more of the story besides that because I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. Right. Um, I really, really like this book a lot um, I, because because there's that shopping app that Duck Collector, your package was delivered. One item from Amazon. I better get upstairs. Um, <laughs> Uh, the opioid epidemic in a in a town where the coal industry is dying made it very real to me. Um, it, uh, all of the elements seemed very real. Uh, you know, where where he has a a, a pregnant uh, fiance that uh, his I think his mom doesn't like the fiance, and you the know, mom's really like anybody. No. <laughs> His dad's dying of black lung, and um, so it all seemed very real. And then this supernatural, which makes it very believable, and then this supernatural element is dropped in there. And I, I mean, it doesn't take that much of a step to believe that that it existed, because it was it was all root. It all seemed rooted in reality. Um, I really, I really did enjoy it. I maybe I maybe I did love it more than I'm thinking about now. Maybe maybe I loved it as much as uh, Lonesome Days and Savage Nights. The ending was a bit rushed for me. That was my main thing. Um, it kind of jumps forward in time at the end. I'm like, wait, I feel like there's more story to be told here. <laughs> I feel like there's more you can be telling me. That was one thing that kind of yeah. threw me off towards the end. I was like, oh, that, they're jumping forward already. I feel like there's like at least ten more pages of things that need to happen before you go to the epilogue. That was one thing right. that kind of threw me off towards the end. I'm not going to say what it was. Yeah. So this book is Red Fork, and I uh, am using my powers as Darth Braggadocia to bump it up to I Loved It. So I Loved It and Lonesome Days and Savage Nights. And I'd never heard of any of these creators. Have uh, you? You haven't heard of Steve Niles? That was, no, that was for, I'm talking about for Red Fork. Oh, Steve, oh, oh, oh. Steve Niles did uh, Lonesome Days, Savage Nights. I'm talking yeah. about the Red Fork. Oh, well, I thought you meant all these Traders on this book on the front. I okay, never heard of yeah. any of them. No, I hadn't either. I hadn't either. Um, yeah, so I thought it was a good debut. If it's their, their, their debut, I think it's great. Uh, if it's not, I thought it was a, a great TKO debut for them. Um, yeah. This is your second favorite, right? Well, I'm bumping it up to it's tied now with Lonesome okay. and Savage Nights. I like them both a heck of a lot. I, they're definitely keepers that I am not giving away, and I want to reread them. Yeah, hopefully in the future we'll have a sequel to this that we can talk about and see how that goes to Lonesome yeah. and Savage Nights. All right, so I think we're both – at least we're in agreement with it being our third out of, the, of these three, and that okay. would be The Pool by Steve Orlando. So I'll read off the back, okay, and then Jess will show off the art, and then I'll have Jess talk first, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll give my thoughts of it. So okay. six days to live, a lifetime to make up for. What would you do if you only had six days left to live, fight or give up? That's the choice given to Brenton Dim, one of Earth's 13 Horizon agents, when the unstoppable force that is the undoer races towards Earth. The problem is, ever since surviving a massacre of his own making, Dem has been incapable of giving... I don't want to swear because I'm the going to strip comics. So, you know, giving up, you know what. But when his ex that word? I just don't want to say it. But when his ex-lover and brilliant scientist. Then. Just say darn. Okay. He doesn't give a darn. There we go. <laughs> but when his ex-lover and brilliant scientist, Guyano, Tith, tells him the world doesn't have to end so long, doesn't have to end so long as they work together, Dem realizes the only way to save himself is to save us all. So this book is definitely – the art is definitely manga-ish. Would you agree very, with that, Jess? It's very yeah, manga-ish. So, Jess, why don't you give me your thoughts, and I'll go off of you and see what I have to say. Okay. Uh, Alex is a great writer from the UK. Alex Packnadel. Okay. Um, that's what Thomas Coles has to uh, say. I have a friend though. I haven't read it yet. I think that's from Vault. I'd be interested to check out more from him. Yeah, I definitely I have, enjoyed it. I have friendos, so I'll read it. Um, 
and Chris M is upset about something. Uh, I would. He, he's, he's upset. I said, darn. Sorry to disappoint you, Chris. Um. <laughs> uh, first of all, I had a problem with the art. This, to me, of all the uh, premises or ideas or um, uh, or um, 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 what am I trying to say? This This had the most original and interesting premise for me that they discover a um, an element in the earth that uh, makes these horizon agents um, invulnerable, pretty much. And these horizon agents are peacekeepers, sort of. You get uh, one quick page of explanation in the very beginning of what they are. It's like the first page is like all, ex all exposition. Right. Kind of setting up who they are. Marbleite is what they discover, and it, they call it hard heat, that the uh, energy drawn from deep realities and molecular bonds. Uh, so I, each with a prosthesis of pure marbleite. So, but there's a cost to using this hard heat, and that is that it draws, because of its use, it's drawing a deadly force that is created by its use to come consume the earth called the undoer. And the scientists that have this theory about it are initially, initially like Jor-El from Krypton, laughed at that this thing is coming. The undoer is the name. Sorry? The undoer is this force. It's kind of like almost like Galactus, like a planet eater in a way. Yeah, the undoer. Um, and it is, it turns out it is coming and there's like a countdown clock and um, Brent and Dem it, uh, made a huge mistake early in his career. And now his scientist girlfriend or not ex, his ex-girlfriend and her, her, his scientist ex-girlfriend and his, her father discovered that uh, the Marbleite and the hard heat created by it was going to create this undoer to come to Earth. Her father forms a cult, a doomsday cult. I don't want to give anything away more than that. That sounds super interesting to me that um, the whole thing sounds really interesting. One of the things that pulled me out of this book was the manga-ish art. They... They that have, might be a draw for certain people, but I don't think it's a draw for you and I. Well, the, my problem wasn't with it isn't actually that it's manga-ish. It's that they have the same expressions throughout the book. Because their eyes don't change at all, um, they always look evil and angry, all the characters. Um, there's, there's only one emotion shown on their face, and that is... That of somebody angry uh, and evil, even in even in like the fun scenes where they're trying to, you know, work together. This is what they look like all the time. It's like they're constipated the entire time. Well, now I don't think you needed to say that, but oh, sorry. Yeah, you should have just said "damn," but <laughs> um, but my point is that it was hard for me to enjoy the story with characters that showed one emotion on their face. Um, and it, it was very raw to me, much rawer than the other two. There was, a, uh, I, I don't mind swearing, that's fine. But um, if there's a point, but there was so much swearing and so much rawness in this, it was so different from the other books. Just pointless nudity that had no reason for being there. And pointless swearing throughout it that I thought it's 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 being overused. It's not being used to make a point. It's it's almost like they're trying to be edgy by by swearing a lot. Yeah. Like there's like like there's like some movies, like you can watch a movie like Pulp Fiction or The Town, where it's like, okay, people in these settings actually talk like this. So right. this makes sense. But in this, there's like 
we're making this hard edge. We're making this R rated. So we're just going to put a bunch of random swearing and nudity in there. And there's no point to it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I this art just looked really uninteresting to me. Um, because it all, it just looked the same throughout the book. And I couldn't get into it because the, the story, I'm, I have to say, I'm not convinced that Steve Orlando should really be writing books because I, I think I've read one book by him that Mid I liked. Midnighter and Apollo. Exactly. Midnighter and Apollo. That's the only book I've ever liked from him. Peace and love, peace and love. He may be a great guy. I apologize uh, for saying this. I, I know it's hard to be a writer and get stuff done. I know it. How I, I'm certainly not going to pour root beer on it, but I because I don't do that anymore. I'm just not convinced he's meant to be writing comic books because this was very thrown together and choppy. I thought, and I didn't. I. I didn't find it a struggle to read, but I was kind of happy when I was done because it just, it didn't, it didn't connect with me. Is this an honest, safe space for me, Jess, to be honest about how I felt about this book? <laughs> yeah, I, you can do it without swearing. No, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Like, I really do appreciate TKO giving us these books. So, and I really did like most of the books. I just, I have to be honest. I, I don't want to be yeah. fake and just not... This was not just my least favorite TKO book. It was my least favorite book I've read all year. I, there were multiple points where I would just be reading it and I'd be like, oh, do I have to keep reading this? Like, I just don't want to read anymore. It was like last night I was like, oh, like forcing myself. Do you ever have certain books where you need to finish it and you're almost like dread going back to it? You're just like, oh, I got to read that again. I just, it was, there was nothing about this book that I liked at all, like at all. And I, I don't think I'm going to read any more Steve Orlando books. Again, peace and love. He's probably a great guy. I just, his writing doesn't connect with me right. and this art didn't do it for me. The story didn't do it for me. It was so convoluted, hard heat, mag, bl blah, 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 whatever it was, the undoer. There were so many random things thrown out there. I'm just like, what's going on? I have no idea what's going on. And the end was just like, that's what I endured these six issues for. Like it just, it just wasn't for me at all. And so I just, I have to be honest about it and I just yeah. did not enjoy it at all. It was, I gave it a one star on Goodreads. I just didn't find it interesting in the slightest. But we did love the two other books. We at least liked to love the other two books. I, I liked Sa Lonesome Day, Savage Nights. I really enjoyed Red Fork. And I just really, really couldn't stand this book. Those are my <laughs> honest opinions. Yeah, we have to be honest. I will say Midnighter and Apollo is great. I love that book. Uh, that's in my Midnighter and um, uh, Authority section of my library with, I, well, actually, I got to put that together more because I have a lot more Authority paperbacks that I've got, uh, which will be a good project. I love reorganizing, so that'll be a good project. But uh, now that's a tangent. That is a great tangent because I got to reorganizing my Authority pile from this book so you should be you should be happy <laughs> if you're a tangent lover you should be happy with that tangent um so we really cared for two of the books and didn't care for one of the books that's pretty good considering that the second wave was a big disappointment where i only liked one out of the four liking two out of the three is much better and we can't speak to the other things that came out with the third wave because they didn't send us the short story issues and the there's like a sh short story collection mixed with comics like it's called it's called Blood Like Garnets that TKO also put out so I can't speak to those so that might also be something that people enjoy I just can't speak to the quality of those items in the mm -hmm. third wave. Um, uh, Thomas Coles, we spoke about blue and green at uh, the very beginning after we stopped the tangents. Um, Taylor didn't care for it. I really liked it. Uh, it in some I would age. say it was good. It was good. Okay. I just okay. think it could have been a lot stronger. That's my main critique of it. Right. And here's a good question. Crazy Jane, if you had to pick one book. Out of all four of the ones you reviewed? I would or, say, the three, or the three TKO books. I would say Red Fork. <laughs> would be my favorite of all the ones in the new wave. Um, 
<laughs> and I would say Lonesome Days and Savage Nights would be the, my one pick. And Jess and I uh, have come to an agreement. I'm all allowed to text Jess about the books before we read the, before we review the books on air. Right. I, I think I was starting to rant about the pool, and Jess was like, uh-uh, no, 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 don't say I, anything. Apparently, I don't want you to influence me. I'm not that persuasive with my wife, but for some <laughs> reason, my persuasive powers are really powerful with Jess, and that I'm able to influence what he thinks about comics. Well, so, if, if I'm starting to read a comic and you say, oh, my gosh, I didn't like this at all, it's going to – it's going to color my opinion of the book going into it. Well, I think it's almost it's it's the same with the opposite too. Or people, I think that's what happens with me with certain books. Or people are like this book is awesome. You have to yeah. read it. And you read it. And you're just like that was okay. Yeah, it's almost better if you don't know anything about any books. And they can, but yeah. again, you have to pick up things that you, people recommend. But that you can have both ends of it, where someone overhypes a book and you read it like, what was? Why did people love that book so much? <laughs> <laughs> or the opposite, where someone's like, I hate this book, and you kind of go into it expecting to hate it. So I do get that. Can you think of a book offhand that a lot of people loved and you didn't care for? And as I'm saying that, I'm trying to come up with the answer myself. Um, I, I don't know that I can think of that. Uh, something I will, that I, will say, I will say this book is bad. I think Grayson was way overhyped for me. Hmm. And I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying it's not good. I still have it in my collection. I just think it took a while for it to really get off the ground for me. And then when the story finally picked up for me, Mikhail Yanin jumped off the book. Hmm. And Mikhail Yanin is just so fantastic. There's no artist who can compare to him to follow up in that. Though there are artists who can stand who could follow up with him, but the artists they picked just couldn't just couldn't pass that <laughs> Mikhail Yanin awesome level. And it kind of again took me out of the story. And so I, I just feel like that book was a little bit overhyped for me. The story didn't really come together for me. It's probably my least favorite Tom King book that I've read. Huh. Okay. I'm um, trying to uh, trying to think of a overhyped book that's in my collection that I didn't care for. On our first episode of Batter Days, we did over, you know underrated and overrated Batman books, and one of mine was actually one I've changed my mind on slightly, and that's White Knight. I think White Knight was really overhyped for me, and I went into it and it didn't enjoy it that much. But on a second read through, I did enjoy it more because I went in having those expectations already from the first read. So sometimes I can like books better on a reread. So that, I might, agree. Happen, that might happen with Grayson, where I go back saying, "Okay, this is my initial conception of it. Maybe I'll like it better this time." It's I, like it's like what's that Olympic sport where the the high jump or something? We have to clear the bar. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of like that, where like pole you're, vault? yeah, the pole vault. You're expecting it to be like a there's a ten out of ten, like not touch the bar at all. And you feel like you just kind of slam into the bar and you get up like <laughs> what the world just happened? Like that was that was nothing what I was expecting. So uh, I agree with you. Around. I agree with you on White Knight that I liked it a lot better on the second read. I mean, I I was very lukewarm on it on the first read, and then I reread re it to get us ready for. What was it? Curse of the White Knight? Yeah. When we reviewed that. Um, and I really, really liked White Knight. And it makes me want to read Last Night on Earth again to see if I like it better uh, this time. Yeah, I, I still like Curse of the White Knight better. But I definitely like White Knight better on the second reread. So that might happen with Grayson for me. Again, oh, you, like, you liked Curse of the White Knight better than White Knight? Yeah, because... We'll go back to our. If you want to watch, if you want to watch our, our our reviews of that, we have a video on Batter Days from a couple months ago. I think Curse the White Knight had some really interesting examinations of Bruce Wayne, his family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas White Knight was all about the Joker. I didn't find his story that interesting. So yeah. I liked that it focused more on Bruce in the second story. And the first story they didn't even focus on Bruce. And whenever they did, he was just like a hulked out, angry maniac. Yeah. Who couldn't, who couldn't be communicated with, and just didn't seem very Batman to me. Yeah. Um, that's why I want to read. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly why I want to read Last Night on Earth. Because <laughs> you're, you, you, bought why, right? you bought all the why? figures. Yeah. I got all the, I pre ordered all the action figures from GameStop, and those action figures are boss. I think I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, this, these characters uh, really look like they came from a good story. So I want to reread that because I maybe I blazed through that too fast and didn't give it the attention it need. And Chris M threw out two of his overhyped reads, and that's Day Tripper and Sheriff of Babylon. 
Yeah. Wow. I haven't read Day Tripper, but I love Sheriff of Babylon. Day Tripper definitely is a book that I think Chris M might be the first person I've ever heard say that he didn't care for it, which is fine. Uh, your opinion here is valid. We don't judge anybody, uh, but it definitely, I feel like, um, oh, and Omar said he liked Day Tripper, but it wasn't, I don't know if it's supposed to be life changing, but it's a, it's a, it's a book that people were dying to get in absolute size. I wouldn't say life changing, but people do talk about it. Like it was a very important book for them. Like I know Omar talks about, no Omar Reyes, Omar from Nearman Condition talks about how important that book is to him. I think I remember Lou talking about being, that being a very important book for him, not just from a story standpoint, but emotionally. Yeah. So I, I don't want to say life changing, right. but it definitely like life bolstering in a way. It kind of like helps you view your life from a different angle and appreciate life in a different way. So that seems to happen for most people, but for some, I guess it, I guess it doesn't. So. And you haven't read it? I haven't read it yet. I need to read it. Okay, yeah. I found it to be very emotional, and I definitely enjoyed it. Here's a, a good idea. What do you guys think of East of West? Can you review that series? Hell yes, we can. Oops, sorry. Heck yes, we can. You can say it. I just, I just don't want to say it. Yeah, I I'm got it. I'm not going to judge you. Yeah. I, I, what show could we review that on? Let, well, let's do it on Patter Days. <laughs> okay. We kind of just like want to do whatever we want to do at this point. I mean, yeah. we came um, up with these constraints. We can break them if we want. Um, what this, we is probably, this is probably the least crime corner out of all the crime corners we've done. <laughs> oh, there was no crime involved at all. That's not true. This Lonesome Day Savage Nights. That was a horror crime book. Oh, okay. Barely. Um, He's a detective, even though he didn't do any detecting. <laughs> um, I think we should review East of West and Paper Girls. I you can say that. Jess says I I give him too much homework. So if Jess wants to assign that for us, we can do that. Yeah, it's three big hardcovers each. I just don't. I'm not going to assign it. If you want to do it, I'll do it. But but I I feel like once I open those boxes and get the third volume of each, I'm going to go right upstairs and start reading. I just don't want you texting me in two weeks. Oh, why are we reading so many books? Oh, stop. <laughs> you're, the one, you're the one who gave us the 100 issue Superman review. <laughs> you're, you're indignant. I sound, I sound like anyway. <laughs> your indignance was hilarious. That was worth it. <laughs> I, was just, I was just messing with you. <laughs> what a jerk. Uh, um, you do beep 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 beep. Or Shaq is asking, uh, what about a best Western comic show? Uh, I can't really think of a lot off the top of my head besides Jonah Hex. I don't, yeah, I think I own a lot more Western comics than you do, so I don't, I mean, I can pull six Western books in five minutes out of my collection to review. I love Westerns, too. I just can't think of... Well, I mean, I can pull some and we can read them. Um, yeah, that'd There's... be easy. Okay. And I, I know good ones, too. I know we want to do a war episode, too, especially a Garth Ennis war episode. I, I think it should be just Gar Garth Ennis war episode. We have so many ideas for all of our shows. It's just a matter of when we're going to do them. Yeah, Bouncer is exactly one of the ones I was thinking of. Uh, Chase Chew. What's that? Doesn't Brian Azzarello have a Western comic? I can't remember what it's called. It's through Vertigo. It was like one of his first Vertigo books. Um, oh, I can't remember what that's called. If anyone can remember, that would be that'd be really helpful. Let me see. Loveless. That's what it is. Oh, I have that book. Isn't that a Western? I don't know. Let me look at it. <laughs> ah! My I still need it. I still need to read Moonshine by Brian Azzarello. Oh. I keep hoping that a hardcover will be announced. I don't want to buy the trades. Well, it is going to be announced because I bought all three. Four. That's true. Chris M is asking, is Copperhead qualify as a Western? I think so, yeah. I've heard, I've heard you and Gabe really talk about that book in a really positive light, so that could be interesting. Uh, that, is a, that is a great book. The only issue is... It takes so long to come out. Actually, East of West kind of is a Western in a way. It's like a Western sci-fi book, if you think about it. Um, yeah. 
But that should probably be its own show. East of West? Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. a big series to commit to. I'm not finding Loveless. Why am I not finding Loveless? I'm I'm a hundred percent sure I have it. Yeah, um, Chris Chase Chu says that Preacher is a Western. So that's a book scalp, that's Scalp the Western. Not really. I mean, I mean you, can, you, can, you can say books have a Western tinge to them. Like yeah. It has a Western element, even though it's not set back in the early 1900s or 1800s. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we, we can talk about that offline, try to figure out what books we could review. Or we can just bring our own books to the table, like, hey, here's a good Western book. Instead what? of having to review a bunch, we could just say, here are some good ones. I think Scalped is more of a crime corner book. Yeah, I would say so. So that can be something we talk about, figuring there, out a Western. There are some parts of American Pulp. Vampire that are Western. Pulp is kind of a Western. Yeah. Because it's about a guy who used to be a cowboy who becomes a pulp writer. So that's a really great. Oh, Six Gun? Yeah, that was, the, that was one of the ones I was thinking of. Oh, that's gosh. I need to buy that series. It's just so expensive to buy the whole series. It's like those hardcovers are expensive, man. Yeah. I feel like I feel like uh, Chad Dog trying to pull those manhole covers out of my wallet to pay for it. <laughs> do, you, do you understand the reference when I say he throws nickels around like they're manhole covers? I just always thought it was like – like they're just, I just, I don't, maybe I'll understand the, what the reference was originally. Is that from um, a TV show or a movie? No, it's just a saying about that's how you know somebody's a tightwad because it's hard to throw manhole covers. Yeah, that's what I thought it That's what I thought it meant. Yeah. And, and so he throws nickels around like their manhole covers means he's a super tightwad. Ooh, Joe Chip, really good point. American Vampire. That's a Western comic. You did? I wasn't paying attention then. Well, you don't pay attention to me a lot of times. Oh, Whatever, man. We're we're having some we're having some arguments today. Our issues are really coming to the forefront. That's that, that's not an argument. But the best, but I can't be that upset over our arguments today because you didn't tell me what you said to Tyler yesterday on the show. It's hard to be friends with you. So that was much that was much worse. <laughs> that I told Tyler that. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So I'm just saying this isn't too bad then. What we're doing right now. <laughs> If you consider that an argument, <laughs> I think I just jabbed you for two seconds. I'm just messing. All right, I've so forgotten what I said. Have you uh, read Six Gun Gorilla by Cy Spurrier? Uh, I own it, but I haven't read it. That so that sounds like it'd be a good western. Um, Streets of Glory by Ennis. Never heard of that one. Uh, oh, there's Chad Omni Dog. Oh, he just showed up out of nowhere. He must have been lurking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I used to, I just love saying the whole manhole thing because Chad Omidog always says, I have no idea what that means. Why do you guys keep saying that? <laughs> I was hoping he wouldn't be here so he'd continue on not knowing, but now he knows. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Look at that picture of me. Good grief. That was your wedding, right? Yeah. Man, look how happy you were that day. I did just log on and heard my name, says Chad Omnidog. Yeah, look at how happy I am. I'm still that happy. I, now, Streets of Glory, is that a Western? I didn't, I, I, I thought I knew all, between the two of us, I thought we knew all Ennis books. This is one I haven't heard of. And someone else also said that, I guess you could probably classify Preacher as a Western of sorts. Uh, I don't know how I would classify Preacher. You I haven't found heard it, of, right? I've read the first uh, hardcover. It just wasn't for me. No, uh -huh. it, was a, it was a bit too blasphemous for the Minister of Comics, but it, right. I, I definitely understand the appeal for a lot of people. It just wasn't for me personally. Right. I get it. Okay. So I found it on Amazon. It's from Avatar Press, Streets of Glory by Garth Ennis. Oh, okay. There's one left in stock on Amazon. Get it. Well, uh, you should probably, you're probably going to buy it, aren't you? <laughs> probably. Or somebody else. You know, one of my favorite moments in our shows is whenever we sold out Fury Max on Amazon that day. That was a great feeling. Remember that? Say that again? Remember when that we did the review of Fury Max and we sold it out on Amazon? There was like 12 copies left. Oh, like yeah. Every, everybody bought it. That was a great that was, feeling. That was really fun. That was hilarious. Uh, okay, so Chase Chu says Streets of Glory is a Western. Okay, we'll check that out. Six Gun Gorilla is great. It's as much sci-fi as a Western, though. Mm, that's cool. Um, the best. Oh, here's a European 
with his opinion. Uh, Blueberry, Buddy Longway, Jerry Spring, and Jeremiah. Blueberry, I have like four different volumes of it. It's impossible for Americans to get that book. It's so out of print here. I would love new volumes of Blueberry, Omnibus, uh, Thick Trade, something. Because I've heard so much great about Blueberry, but I can't even read it. It's so hard to find here. So Streets of Glory is on in stock trades, and there's, and there's a hardcover on in stock trades too. Ooh! And it's only six dollars more than the trade. So well, I'm getting that. We know what Jess is getting in his next order, or in his order in twenty minutes. <laughs> uh. Yeah. So this show might take a little bit of doing trying to figure out what all the books we'll talk about, or me and Jess can pick our own books, but we'll get to it eventually. It sounds like a really cool. Uh, idea for a show a cowboy slash western show yeah okay good and, and someone mentioned uh three or not as a western but talking about 303 by ennis i read that this year and i enjoyed it i, I wasn't did. sure how i felt about the ending we get i i like I, I wasn't sure how i felt about it intersecting with a certain real life character but oh, I, thought yeah, over, yeah. I thought that was a bridge too far but I did, and I did understand the main message of the book, and I thought it was an important book to read. Uh, I am looking at my Ennis collection, and I do not see Streets of Glory. But Chase Chu is could be one of those people who knows my collection better than I do. Uh, it could be with your Stumptown hardcovers, <laughs> wherever those are. In the twentieth dimension, right? Uh, Cade Riley has a good question, Jess. Yeah. What would you guys suggest is the best way to read an omnibus and not get overwhelmed? Should you stop and read something else sometime, or do you usually just go straight through? Um, that depend. I will just answer. Uh, first of all, Taylor does not like omnis, and his preferred. Uh, format is oversized hardcover. Uh, and honestly, same with me. But I think it depends on what the story is because uh, two Omni Omnis right now that I can think of that you absolutely can't stop at all or you'll be lost and have to start over again is Avengers by Hickman and Fantastic Four by Hickman. Basically anything by Hickman needs to be read straight through. Yeah. You have to read it straight through. You can't stop. Um, if it's an episodic book, like um, maybe Amazing Spider-Man, uh, and each issue is different, then you could take a break. But if it's one long story <laughs> or one long concept, like Hickman writes, you're going to have to read it all the way through. But if it's and Secret Warriors, now that I'm thinking about it, um, but some of the collect omnibus collections are mostly just uh, episodic six arc books, maybe, and the older ones are just one issues. You know, if there's if it's like Silver Age Spider Man, it'll just be each issue stands alone. So you could get away with reading three issues, put a bookmark on it, and then go read a thin trade. And not um, all omnis are huge either. I do have omnis. I think I have like fifteen omnis. And for the most part, they're not that big. What does kind of stop me dead in my tracks with certain Omnis from the big two is whenever you hit some like crossover event issues that have nothing to do with the main story uh -huh. and you don't have all the issues. Like I love that Wolverine and the X-Men by Jason Aaron Omnibus, but it's like you just like hit certain patches where it's like I have no idea what's going on. I didn't read any of those event books. And that can just really rip you out of the story. And so I think it really depends on what book you read. Like if you pull off Wolverine by Mark Miller, that Omnibus, you could read that so quickly. That's such an easily accessible book, yeah. or even something like Punisher Max uh, by Jason Aaron. They're just there's there, there's some book. It really depends on what book you're reading. I think if you're reading a run that ties into a bunch of events, a bunch of crossovers, that was what stops me dead in my tracks and kind of makes me intimidated. But right. if you read like the Hawk Eye Omnibus, and a lot of people kind of hate that one because how expensive it is. But just think of, exa of examples of books that are easy to read. Ms. Marvel's a thin, easily readable omnibus, and it's a great book. 
or Aquaman by Jeff John. That's a somewhat bigger omnibus, but that's a really easy story to read and digest. Yeah. Or Super Sons. I mean, it, I think it really just depends on the story and how, how much it flows. And if it has like starts and stops, which kind of throws me out of the book for me. Um, and then here's a good question for you from the chat Omni Dogster. Oh yeah. That's like my favorite genre. I love how many, how many novels did you read this year? You said I read 28 novels this year. Wow. Which that's a I read 200. I've read 251 books so far this year. 28 of those are novels. The rest are collected editions. I I just can't read anything but comics, and that's I have to, I have to read novels or I kind of get burned out. I get burned out on either. If I just read mm -hmm. novels for a while, but I, I have to read comics. They both kind of feed my flame for both of them. Feed they, your flame. Look at yeah. you. Yeah. There you go. Wow. So yeah, I've read a lot of PI books. Um, some of my favorites, I love Dennis Lehane's uh, Patrick, Kenzie, and Angela Gennaro. I love John Connolly's Charlie Parker series. Um, we both read, not the novel, but we read Lawrence Block's Eight Million Ways to Die, which is based on his series of Matthew Scudder novels. Those are also fantastic. The list is really endless. I love PI books. I think, Jess, you used to read a lot of novels back in the day before you had to do a review show and read a lot of comics. I read a lot of crime novels lot. I loved mysteries. I loved crime books. I, I mean, I still do, but I have to read so many comics for this channel that I don't have time for prose. Um, and I kind of regret it, but I also love reading comics, so it's okay. I, well, you're I'm, also overwhelmed by video games, TVs, movies, so you have a lot of stuff going on. I'm so overwhelmed by television, I don't even watch it. You definitely, I think the next thing you have to do is Mandalorian. That's just, it's been fantastic this season. And people are having a hard time not spoiling it in front of it's, me. I'm surprised you haven't been spoiled yet because every single day it's like spoiler after spoiler online. Yeah. So I think you're going to have to jump onto it soon to avoid spoiling it for yourself. It's not that long of a show either. The sh episodes are usually like 30 some minutes long. Right. Um, <laughs> Cade Riley, you might want to have Tyler jump on to give you some advice about that. Oh my gosh, that's the wrong book to read. <laughs> Clone Saga is that the reason you're having a hard time reading it is because it's awful. I remember Tyler being like, "Should I read the Ben Riley Omnibus or Gotham Central?" We're like, "That's not even a question, man." <laughs> like, come on, like got one of the best comics of all time or the Ben Riley Omnibus? No, Cade, set that Clone Saga aside and and uh, for a long time and read something different. Do you have that book in your collection, Jess? The Clone Saga? Yeah. No. Did no, you ever I, have it in your collection? <laughs> I I did back when it was um, Thick Trades, and that was one of the first things I ever purged. I that sold was back it. in 2016, 2017, Jess, going wild and crazy? Uh, I probably bought that in 2015 or 2014. And then 2018 is when I started purging, and that back was when, when you were back when you were a wild and crazy guy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's 100 percent right. But Lou Lou loves to tell 2016 just stories. Um, and I am about to run out of battery power. All right, you ready to call it? Well, anyway, you're going to be seeing us again tomorrow night. Anyway. So we'll start this up again tomorrow night. Oh yeah, Saturdays in the Bat Cave. And, and our topic, our topic is going to be books that deserve an oversized format or edition, and it could be a series too. Like this is a series or a book that we really love, and it's only in trade paperbacks or maybe in standard hardcover, and it really deserves an absolute. It deserves an omni. It deserves an oversized hardcover. We all have series like that that we wish had the oversized treatment. So Jess and I are going to pick five to seven of our personal favorites that deserve that oversized treatment. So that's going to be on Omni Dogs Vault tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern. And, and I'm sure most of it will be tangents. Yeah, we'll have a big tangent party first. First 45 minutes. I'm sure we have 24 hours to come up with plenty of tangent ideas. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so everybody in the chat, thank you very much. Please leave a like if you can. <laughs> we should change the title. 
Yeah, that's Speakerzoid, a great title. loves our tangents more than anybody else. I think so. He gets like um, he actually gets offended when we do the reviews. <laughs> I'm surprised he stayed. Maybe he left and came back. He came back 20 minutes ago when the tangent started. <laughs> Thank you, chat. You, you we had a great chat tonight, and I really appreciate everybody that participated. Um, uh, please leave a, a like and uh, feel free to subscribe and leave comments. We always answer and tune in again tomorrow night at 7 p.m. For the same two guys, but we're going to be talking about something different. But we'll tangent on you. Hey, we'll <laughs> drop the tangents on you. The reviews have become the tangent. <laughs> He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Oh, <laughs> uh, wait. This is funny. <laughs> All right. We'll try and keep our reviews really short from now on. I felt like we did tonight. Eh. It was decent. <laughs> we try, we'll try better. Okay. Peace and love. Peace and love.